at CN, CNF and DNF conversions and then uh, started using them for verifying whether a proposition is satisfiable or valid. Uh, if the proposition is in CNF, then you can easily find out whether it is valid or not. If it is in DNF, you can similarly find out whether it is satisfiable or not. Uh, then to verify whether a DNF is valid or a CNF is satisfiable, we suggested that we convert it to the other form by using distribution, but that is costly. So, we tried to see whether something can be done about that. It will take some time to do that, do something in that direction, but there are some uh, specific classes or subclasses of these problems which can be solved easily. So, note that this easily means here whether you can solve it in polynomial time or you cannot solve it in polynomial time. The general satisfiability problem as it is, we do not have any algorithm to solve it till now in polynomial time, but if you are told that it is satisfiable, you can verify that within uh, some polynomial time or not. It is not exactly that it tells that given an interpretation whether it satisfies the CNF that can be determined in polynomial time. Okay. So, suppose you have a CNF it has some clauses disjunctive clauses and they are all undead together. Then you are given with an interpretation it is told that this interpretation satisfies it. Now, you just want to verify this much then it should be easy. Is it clear why it is easy? Because in that interpretation you know what are the values of the propositional variables 0 or 1. So, just look at any class there in that class you just take 1 or 0s all that you have to see is whether it is giving 1 to any of those clauses or not then it is satisfiable right. So, that should be quick is it clear. So, it is just something like uh, constructing one row of a truth table. Fine, you have a propositional formula or proposition, you are given with one interpretation, then you are just constructing that row of the truth table. That is that should take only linear time, five polynomial. But the general problem of finding out for all interpretations or searching for an interpretation which will satisfy it looks to be exponential right now because number of rows in the truth table will be exponential in the number of variables right though not exactly in the length of the proposition given or length of the CNF given, but they are related. So, it can be done that way. So, what are the subclasses where this can be done efficiently right. So, one subclass is uh, suppose you have the satisfiability problem asked for one proposition which is in CNF and in the CNF there is only one uh, class uh, one literal in every class right. So, basically it is a conjunctive class uh, is it clear it is a CNF where each disjunctive class contains only one literal right one occurrence of a literal even the literal can be different in each class right. For example, let us give one so, it looks like P 1 this itself is a disjunctive class there is only one literal in a class. Similarly, there is another class which can be say not P 1 or even not P 2 let us say okay. there is another class again having one literal and so on it looks only that way there is only one literal in each class not necessarily the same literal fine. Still the thing should be easier here to handle whether this is satisfiable or not right. See the thing is if P 1 is there not P 1 should not occur then it is satisfiable that is the same thing should be true for all the literals coming up there and that should be easy. So, this is a subclass, but these formulas or these propositions are called to be in one CNF 
in each class there is only there are at most one number of literals present. So, there is no disjunction in any of these classes here. Right? So, this is a 1 C n f. Similarly, you can have a 2 C n f. So, which will say that each class in this C n f will have at most 2 literals. So, there can be at most 1 conjunction there, right? 1 disjunction there. For example, you take say P 1 or P 2 and P 1 or P 3. This is an example of a 2 C n f. There can be only one also. For example, I can have this also. This is again a 2 C n f. Is that clear? So, similarly, you can define a K C n f, where each clause there will have at most K minus 1 disjunctions, K literals, yes. Occurrence of literals is at most K. Fine. So, in this case, we say that the corresponding problem, satisfiability problem, is again coming with that number. We say whether given a case CNF determine it is satisfiable or not, you say you are solving K SAT. Right. So, if the general satisfiability problem is SAT, we will write that as K SAT. Is it clear? So, K SAT will be the problem whether given any uh, KCNF it is satisfiable or not that is the case at. Now, we have an efficient algorithm for one set we can determine any given one CNF whether it is satisfiable or not. Similarly, we have an algorithm which is also efficient for two set if there are only two maximum of two literals present in each class then you can solve it easily. So, there is completely one logical algorithm, but there is a graph algorithm which is easy to visualize they are equivalent. What it says is for the two set it bases on an, a simple observation in a two set a clause will look something like this. Okay, where p 1 p 4 are literals not necessarily proportional variables, there can be negation symbols. Okay. So, this you can write equivalently as uh, not p 1 implies p 4 okay. because of double negation and implication rule. Is it clear? p implies q is not p or q or you could have also written as uh, not p 4 implies p 1. This is commutative, but implies is not. So, we need both of them. You can write this way or you can write this way. Okay. Now, what we do? Given any 2 C n f, we will construct a graph from this. So, constructing the graph is simple. You look at a clause, for that clause, you will have either this way or this way, in fact, both of them. Right. So, for the class P1 or P4, now what you do? Take a node which is P 1, let us label it as P 1. Take a node which is labeled as P 4, take similarly two other nodes which are labeled as not P 1 and not P 4. Okay. So, once P 1 or P 4 is there, you have not P 1 implies P 4. So, from not P 1 to P 4 have one directed edge that represents your implies. Similarly, not P 4 implies P 1, you have another directed as. Okay. So, what you do? What the procedure is asking you to do? Given a 2 C n f, first find out what are the literals coming there or what are the proportional variables. Say, proportional variables are P 1 to P m, then you introduce 2 m number of nodes, their labels will be P 1 to P m, another set of those other m will be labeled as not p 1 not p 2 up to not p m. Fine. Then if p 1 or p 4 is a class then have these two edges in that graph. Now, construct the graph. 
So, once the graph construction is over, this one will be unsatisfiable if and only if there is one path from some literal p to its negation and automatically there will be another from not of p to p also. So, you have to go for a cycle right p to not p to p again. So, in this graph what we see is suppose you get a cycle from some p to p itself, but coming via not p right. Then the original 2 C n f is unsatisfiable and conversely this can be proved. So, it is just a graph search problem for the cycles, but coming to 3 set there is problem. Till now we have not discovered any algorithm which will solve a 3 set instance in polynomial time in arbitrary 3 set instance. Right. The reason is if you do that then set is itself will be solved. You can solve 3 set in polynomial time then set can be solved in polynomial time. There is a reduction right. So, you need not go for 4 set verifying. If you want to solve this problem just concentrate on 3 set that is what it says. Hmm. This is a surprising because the subclass itself is as powerful as the whole class that is what it is going to say us with respect to this searching for an efficient algorithm. So, what it says is 3 sat there is a reduction from sat to 3 sat right. So, an algorithm for solving 3 sat can be used to solve sat itself whether that is satisfiable or not only for the satisfiable determination we are concerned with that only. Then need not be equivalent suppose I have this p or q or r or s again I look at a class can I write this class or corresponding to this class can I have another 3 C n f let us say where I can show that this is satisfiable if and only if the target 3 C n f is also satisfiable this is what I want not exactly equivalence right only satisfiability is to be preserved that is our m now. So, what I do say I take p or q or uh, another say z 1 this I construct I just or it. Next I write and r or s or not z 1. Suppose I introduce this way. Okay. Now, question is suppose I write as C and write this as C prime. Can we show that C is satisfiable if and only if C prime is satisfiable? Well, we can do that provided we try to prove it. Huh? Let us try to prove let us take this as a conjecture and try to prove. If you are through okay, we will try for the next one, we will generalize. If not then we have got a counter example and stop it there right, leave with our unhappiness. So, let us see what happens. Suppose this is satisfiable ok. So, that means at least one of them is 1, others can be 0 allowed to be 0, all of them can also be 1. So, at least one of them is 1. Suppose p is 1 right. So, this is 1, then this whole clause is 1, okay. what about this? If it is 1, I am through. Right. So, suppose it is 0, when can it be 0? When r is 0, when s is 0, when not z 1 is 0, but not z 1 I have freedom, it has not been fixed by my interpretation it is a new propositional variable. So, question is can I extend the interpretation which satisfies C to another giving new values for this new propositional variables which will satisfy it fine that we can do here I can take not z 1 to be 1 by taking z 1 as 0. If I take z 1 0 it is still 1 and this also becomes 1. So, it is possible. Satisfiable uh, for uh, certain uh, values uh, for certain, certain interpretation of PQRS 
and so such that uh, for the same interpretation of PQRS, uh, the initial proposition is also satisfiable. See, there is, there is some gap there. I want to prove C is satisfiable if and only if C prime is satisfiable. So, suppose I try the first one, if C is satisfiable then C prime is satisfiable. For that itself, what I start with a model of C, right. Now, what I do? I want to find one model of C prime. It may not have any connection with that model in the abstract case, right. But usually what should I do? I should try to see whether I can modify the given model to make a model for this, right. In fact, the theorem does not ask you or the result does not ask you to take that model and then find a model for this, no. But that is a hint for us for the proof, fine. Any model can do for this. Now, what I do? Our procedure told us that I can start with that model itself and assign Z1 in such a way along with that. So, it is an extension of that model, so that it will be a model for C prime, that is all. Is it clear? Yeah, so that is one part. See, we have to prove both the things. If C is satisfiable, then C prime is satisfiable, that is our first. Second thing, if C prime is satisfiable, then C is satisfiable. Now, for the first one itself, if C is satisfiable, it has a model. So, I start a model of that. Now, I have to construct a model for C prime. It might come from that model, it might not come, does not matter. But since it is there, let me use it. So, I see that I can extend that model to include a valuation for Z1 for the new variable, which will be a model for C prime. Is that right? So, it looks viable in that case. What about the converse? Suppose C prime is satisfiable. So, that means both of these are assigned to 1, okay. P is 1, Q is 1, Z 1 is 1, R is 1, S is 1, not Z 1 is 1 in the same interpretation. Hmm? Yes, not for you, but when you take a model of this, it says this class is evaluated to 1, this class is evaluated to 1. It does not mean all the variables are to be assigned to 1 here. It is an OR statement, right. So, the whole is assigned to 1, which says P is at least one of this P Q Z 1 is 1, right. So, this says at least one of this is evaluated to 1, right. That is only given. So, from this I choose P to be 1, that itself finishes. Okay, let us see. Suppose C is P or Q or R or S or T. Okay. For this part we know our C prime will have P or Q or Z 1 and R or S or not Z 1. Now, you have to take care of this T. Okay. This is up to this S, I have to take care of this T. So, what I do? I have Z 1 here. I have not Z 1 there. Okay. So, let me take say T or not Z 1 or Z 2, I make it Z 2. Okay. See, this Z 1 and not Z 1 that helped us, right. So, I do not want to leave that pattern, I want to keep it. So, I have P or Q or Z 1, then I take T or not Z 1 or Z 2 and then R or S or not Z 2 as earlier. So, in this ordering as it is written, I am considering this way. So, first part let us see only, second part should be through, it should be quick, right. So, first part if this is satisfiable there is a model for this, how to construct this, how to give values to Z 1, Z 2 and so on, it is an extension. 
So, if p is 1, I keep it as it is z 1, I have freedom to choose letter, right. And I come to this, if t is 1 similarly, I have freedom to two, choose z 1, z 2 letter. If t is 0, then I have to choose one of this, okay. So, I become greedy, I take z 1 to be 0 here, right, because it is not required p is enough to satisfy it. So, then let me take z 1 0, hmm. then what happens here, not z 1 becomes 1 automatically, our construction will go like that, right. So, automatically this one will become 1, but z 1 is 0 and z 1 does not occur here. So, out of r or s they can be false, we are considering the worst way when it can be breaking down. So, if r or s is 0, I have still freedom to choose not z 2. So, not z 2 I choose to be 1, so z 2 is 0 here, that is it okay. So, this can be done, it looks. So, how does it look in general? Suppose, my c is equal to, let us take that first case, p or q or, so I say p 1, p 2 or p 3 or p 4. In that case, I write c prime equal to p 1 or p 2 or z 1 and we wrote or z 1 or not z 1 or z 1. Okay. So, next we take p 3 or p 4 or not z 1. Okay. Now, suppose c equal to p 1 or p 2 or p m, where m is greater than or equal to 5, fine. Then only that inside pattern is coming, otherwise for 4 case it is quick. Then we write c prime equal to p 1 or p 2 or z 1 and let us say go next p 3 or not z 1 or z 2. Okay. It continues, the same pattern continues till somewhere, after that we will come last to p m minus 1 or p m or z m minus 2, looking at this, this is the last term. Right? So, if this is my m minus 1, this should be 2 less, huh? m minus 3, then it should be 3. Okay? m minus 3, hmm? not of that, yes. And what will be here before it? Look at the case 5. Yeah? p m minus 2 or not of z before it m minus 4 or z m minus 3. That is our proposed construction. Okay. Now, we should be able to prove that c is satisfiable if and only if c prime is satisfiable. So, let us try. So, we have this C is satisfiable if and only if C prime is. Now, where should we start? First part, suppose C is satisfiable. Suppose I is a model of C. So, that means I is giving some values to P1, P2, Pm, right? Some values. So, that the whole thing is evaluated as 1. So, that means at least 1 of P1 to Pm is 1, that much we know. 
others we do not know. Okay. Now, just look at our proof what we did here for the case for 5. Suppose q is 1, p is 0, how are you going to do it? This is 1, this is 0. Okay, p is 1, that is the first case we had taken, remember. p is 1, so this one we do not have to worry at all. Now, what about this? So, we choose this to be 0, so that not z 1 can become 1, forgetting about t values. Right? So, in case of p to be 1, we had chosen z 1 to be 0. Okay. Next, this becomes 1. Now, z 2 can be chosen to be 0, so that the other one becomes 1. Right. So, z 2 also we have chosen as 0. Okay. That itself does. We do not have to worry about what the other things are given q, r, t, s, we do not have to worry looking at p alone. Suppose p is 0, say q is 1. Now, how are we going? So, we start from q itself, forget p, we do not have to worry. q is 1, so since this is 1, well, I take this to be 0 associated with it, whatever that variable is, same same thing does, same thing holds. Suppose, instead of q is 1, I have t is 1, q is 0. Now, I have to satisfy this first. So, z 1 I have to take 1, there is an option now, right. So, then t comes here, t comes here and z 1 is fixed, then that onwards the other scheme works, z 2 is 0 as it is, there is no problem. Do you see the pattern? If p q if p is 0, but q is 1, then I have to take z 1 as 0 from q onwards. That is, if a variable p 2 is 0, p 1 is 0, then I choose z 1 to be 0 and then take z 2 to be 0, z 3 to be 0. Now, all z side just take 0, whatever earlier model that works. Right? If t is 1, that is p 3 is 1. So, that is up to p 2 let us say they are all zeros. Then what I do? I have to take z 1 as 1, all the others are zeros. Now, can you tell me the scheme? Hmm. Yeah, suppose I call this as k, right? Before that all of them are zeros, but p k is 1, right. Then what I do? I take z k minus 2 as 1, okay. till that. So, before that say z 1, z 2 up to z k minus 2, that I take as 1, all the others are 0's, that should work, right. So, let us see how to write it. Suppose, I is a model of C. In this model, let k be the least index such that what happens? P k is 1, all others before it are 0, okay? such that P k of i is 1. So, once we say least index, it means before that all of them are 0, right. Is the least index such that i assigns it to 1. So, that means i assigns all the uh, variables before it to 0. Is that okay? If not clear, write it. Note i of p 1, i of p k minus 1 are 0, that is what it says because it is the least index and all the others we are not bothered. Now, what we do extend i to or for z 1 to m minus 
3 m minus 1 okay up to m minus 1 we are involved huh? p m then z m minus 3 z m minus 4 so up to z m minus 3 z 1 to z m minus 3 by what to do yeah suppose it is the kth one then we want to put up to k minus 2 as 0 all the others are 1 is that okay uh, sorry up to that one and 0 onwards 0 after that so we say i of z 1 equal to i of z k minus 2 as 1 and i of z k minus 1 to i of z m minus 3 as 0. This is our new interpretation i. Though we are writing the same i for both the things, it is an extension, it is a new interpretation. It has now in its domain z 1 variables, z variables which were not earlier. In that way, it is different but it is an extension it keeps the same values to pks as earlier okay now we should say that i is a model of c prime it is only construction it's a guesswork only up to some 5 you have to really show it fine so our claim is now i is a model of c prime this c prime now let us find out how it is a model of c prime now for the first class what happens hmm? i of this up to up to z k minus 2 we uh, k minus 2 uh, so first k minus 2 clauses are evaluated to 1 right so now i is a model of first k minus 1 clauses. So, when we wrote c prime that way, we are not going to rewrite it, you have to write it that way only. So, that first, second they are meaningful. Okay. How many are there? You are giving 1 as k minus 2. So, you have to say k minus 2 clauses due to first condition. Let us say the first condition as 1, second condition as 2. So, due to one next so you have to be concerned about k minus first class and onwards so k minus first class has what p k so p k is assigned to one huh. now due to two other clauses, clauses are assigned to 1 by i, right. Hence, i is a model of C prime. So, that is the difficult part you have finished. Huh? So, now the converse part, conversely suppose i j as a j j model of c prime. Now, you must find a model for c. Okay. So, what to do here? Yes. One, there will always be one uh, clause, uh, there will always be one clause such, uh, as there where be between the k, the k minus 1 clause, wherein uh, all the z will not contribute to the clause that being uh, uh, validated and it is because of the, the literal over there. Hence, uh, since we can always find such a clause, therefore, uh, the initial c is uh, uh, satisfiable. Hmm. So, idea is if you look at the z's, you have one z 1 then there is negation. Okay. 
if you look at all z m minus 3 then also it is negation. So, suppose you have a model for c prime, it will assign z to something 1 or 0 whatever it is. Okay. So, whenever one is assigned 1 the other is assigned 0 fine in the same model. Therefore, in this class suppose you have not z m minus 3 is assigned to 0, then one of these will become 1. We have to proceed similarly. The similarly is difficult to write. <laughs> okay. So, how to write it exactly? you want to prove by contradiction. Hmm? So, in that case we assume that i is a model of c prime, but i is not a model of c or there is no model of c rather right not that the same i or same j there is no model of c. Okay? This is what you want to say is it not. All the p ones, all the p p i's will remove from the c dash, so we'll have a new construction mm -hmm. that is z one and not z one or z two. Mm -hmm. We can show that it is unsatisfiable. Mm -hmm. So from that uh, we can show that c dash will be satisfiable only if one of those other literals is uh, one, then c will be satisfiable. Hmm. So removing means assigning them to zero, is it not? That's what you are telling. So, better assign them to 0 that will be explicit. Huh? So, that is same thing as assuming c is unsatisfiable. Now, let us try that. Okay. So, suppose j is a model of c prime, but c is unsatisfiable. So, once c is unsatisfiable, whatever model you choose, whatever interpretation you choose, it is not a model of c. Right? Therefore, J is not a model of C prime, the same J is not a model of C prime, model of C right, it is not a model of C. Okay. So, which means J assigns 0 to all those variables. So, that means J of P 1 equal to J of P m equal to 0. Okay. Now, look at our construction, all these are zeros everywhere up to this, all these are zeros, but C prime is satisfiable. So, starting from the first class, we have to take j of z 1 as 1, is that right. So, once j of z 1 is 1 in the second class, P 3 is 0, not z 1 is 0, therefore, z 2 has to be 1. See our construction of list k it is really helping us now also. Huh? The same pattern is coming here. So, that means you will see that all of this z 1 to all of this z m i 3 has to be 1. If they are 1 then the last plus becomes 0. Therefore, j is not a model of c prime which is a contradiction. Is it clear? So, let us write it. Then the first class in C prime has P 1, P 2, Z 1 itself J of Z 1 is 1. Okay. Now, uh, from the second class we see j of z 2 is 1. Right? So, continuing up to the last but one class in C prime we see that 
j of z 1 equal to j of z 2 equal to j of z what is that m minus 2 m minus 3 z m minus 3 is 1 then j of the last class okay which is j of p m minus 1 or p m or not of z m minus 3 is 0. Okay. So, this contradicts the assumption that j is a model of c prime is that right. So, that means, we have shown that c is satisfiable if and only if c prime is satisfiable. Okay. C prime is a CNF. So, that means, a clause is satisfiable having m number of literals if and only if a 3 CNF is satisfiable and we had given the construction for the 3 CNF. Now, if you start with any CNF, each clause you can write as a 3 CNF corresponding primes. Okay. Then go on uh, conjuncting them together, so you end up with a 3 CNF. Now, the question is will this 3 CNF have exponential length corresponding to the length of the original CNF? Let us look at a class. For each class, how many classes you are giving in the 3 CNF? Suppose C has C has m literals. So, in in C prime at most 3 m occurrences of literals, each one is 3. So, at most there are m factors, really less, right? It will be less. So, let us write at most 3 m occurrences of literals. Okay. So, that means, length of this and length of this is just a constant multiple. Okay. Length means total number of symbols occurring in it. So, length of C prime is a constant multiple of length of C and this constant is fixed for any given class, it does not matter whatever it is. Right? Why? Because you take any start from any given CNF. In the CNF, first find out what is the maximum number of uh, literals occurring in a class. Right? So this constant will depend on that. So for the given C, you can find one constant here, three, four, or whatever. Right? So that constant remains for all. It doesn't change throughout when you write for clauses to 3 CNF, fine, you take the maximum possible. So, since it is a constant, now if set can be solved for this efficiently, set can be solved for this efficiently, okay. it is just a constant multiple, length is not making it exponential times the length of that, it is just a constant multiple. Is it clear? So, therefore, set can be converted to 3 set if you solve only 3 set that will solve your NPP problem, huh? because set is NP complete, 3 set is also NP complete. So, we can solve or prove that 3 set is in P, then that will show NP equal to P. If you show 3 set is not in P, yeah, that will solve P is not equal to NP or not, yes, because because and completeness is required there, right? It is not only it is completeness. So because that is NP complete, so three set is also NP complete. So it belongs to P or not in P determines whether P is equal to NP or P is not equal to NP. Okay. Fine. So let's stop here. Uh, today only we have done this much that sat or 3 set they are equivalent in this sense. Okay. 3 set if it is proved 
to be uh, in P or NP that way P and NP their fate also will be decided. 